Okay, thank you. Does this work? Yeah. Okay, so, um, my name is Danny Engelbart. Uh, I've been working in Unix since 1991, so quite a while. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk to you about something completely different. Um, you've been here for a few days, right? Some of you even a few days longer, had some trainings. I've seen all this nice new stuff, and I'm going to talk about very old stuff, extremely old stuff. So I thought that's something completely different, and well, if I'm going to do a Monty Python quote, then well, I need to add Monty Python. Sorry for that, but I had to do that. Another thing I have to do is I have to warn you, because this talk may contain traces of Pearl. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Actually, who am I kidding? This talk contains traces of Pearl. There's no way around it. Sorry for that, but just so you know. Okay, so regular expressions or regexes in Python. Why would I want to talk about that? I mean, it's old, really old, right? Well, I've seen a talk, and I'm going to get back to that later, um, which says everything you know about regexes is wrong. And I think that applies for a lot of people here as well. And um, I want to talk to you about that. So, first, a little history. Um, regexes, like I said, they're old. Uh, we started with regexes, actually, uh, Professor Stephen Kleen uh, was looking into something called regular events uh, back in the 50s, and that was a way to program non-deterministic finite automaton. That's all theoretical computer mathematician stuff, right? So, in the 60s, Ken Thompson came along, and he was working on an IBM 709 computer, and if you don't know what that looks like, it was something like that. Well, actually, that is only the CPU module, there's a bit more to it. But, he was working on that thing, and they had a QED text editor, and he added regular expressions to that. So, back in the 60s, we already had regexes, on computers. Now this Ken Thompson fellow, he moves on, and in the 70s, he writes a operating system called Unix. You might have heard of it. Right? On this operating system, you got the ED editor, which he wrote as well, and so it includes regexes. And others picked up on this. First we got grep, which is actually just a ED function. It's actually global regular expression print, and that works on a directory full of files. Other things, awk includes regexes, set includes regexes, and all of these have their own little syntax because they have to fit with the original program, right? So they all have a little slightly different di uh, dialect. Emacs regexes as well, and a dialect which contains a whole shitload of backslashes. I've been told if it doesn't work in Emacs, just sprinkle on a few more backslashes and there you go. The X editor also includes regexes and you're thinking X, what's X? X is VI before it became visible. So we move on to the 80s and that's when uh, this guy Larry Wall came along. You might know him. He's that evil person that created Perl, right? And Perl does some funky stuff with regexes. Really, back in that time? Oh, God. So, Perl. But, well, let's just forget about Perl. We'll just use PCRE. It's Perl-compatible regex engine. This, this got on later in the, uh, in the later uh, times, but... We move on first to the 90s, and of course, in the 90s, we get Python. Yay, Python. <laughs> so, Python has its own little history with your regexes. First, we had the regexp module, which had API version 1, and which was replaced by the regex module. Not to be confused with the other regex module that came a lot later, this was a, uh, the, the, the first regex. 
right? Uh, this had API version 2 and it had its regex syntax submodule, which actually allowed you to choose which dialect you wanted to use in your regex. And for some reason, Emacs was the default. Go figure. So then we get to Python 1.5.1 alpha, and we get a RE module, RE version 3 API, and you're thinking, hey, that's the one I know. No, you don't. Because that module was never, uh, well, it was released in the final release, but as RE1. And RE itself was replaced with another module called RE, RE version 2, which used the PRE submodule, and PRE is actually based on PCRE, and that's where the Perl comes in. So, okay, we've got PRE, we've been working with that for a while, and then we get Unicode, and we need something that can work with Unicode. So we get the SRE module, and the PRE module is deprecated, it's then later removed, and the RE module is actually only contains the SRE module. So we move the SRE module into the RE module, and that is what you're working with today. And because it's so old, I think it should look like this, really. <laughs> so back to that statement, everything you know about regexes is wrong. Like I said, this was a title of a talk by Damien Conway, and Damien Conway is also a Perl uh, guru. Uh, he does a lot of things with Perl 6, and so we'll just call him that other evil person. But he does, in fact, give very, very good talks. So if you ever have a chance and you dare to go into the camel camp, if you will, then go and see his talks. He's really good. But um, the thing I learned from his talk, first of all, is that you might think you know regular expressions, but they might work a little different than what you think they do. And it's not your fault. You see, you've seen the history, right? We heavily rely on, uh, we are heavily influenced by Perl. And well, Perl is a bit fuzzy, so regexes probably are as well. So. If you write up a definition of a regular expression, it might look something like this. So a regular expression is a decorative specification describing the textual structure to which a matching string must confer. That sounds about right, right? Yeah, just a few things wrong with that. First of all, a regular expression is not decorative. It's not descriptive. It does not specify structure, and it does not conform. So what do we get? We get something like this. <laughs> and, well, yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe this would be better. It's just not, not that. <laughs> right? So what is it then? What is a regular expression? A regular expression is code. And I might give a fancy definition for that too. Yeah, a specification of a block structured instruction sequence which is designed to execute some task on a highly specialized virtual machine, but it's just code. It's commands, loops, assertions, exception handling, exception handling, yes, exception handling. It's code, rotten code, I'll give you that, <laughs> really is, but it's code. So. That R regex string thingy, that's actually a function you're calling. It's a function by itself. And it's executed by the regex engine. So this function returns a result. It returns true, or false, or maybe some extra stuff. We'll get back to that later. Right? But they're code. Regex is code. And to understand how to create a regex, you just need to learn the language. That's all that is, that is to it. Now, you've all done that. So how hard could it be to just learn another one, right? OK, so you, you, need to you need to understand the execution model as well, because that might be a bit weird. I mean, 
regexes just run in their own little world, RVM, as I said in the definition, right? Um, theoretically, regexes are based on a finite state machine, but they're not really. In, in practice, they're just a stack-based machine like everything else. But theoretically, a finite state machine. And that's handy to use because then I can, if I use this theory, I can explain regexes using graphs, state, state graphs, right? So if we look at a very simple regex that just says match an A, then match a B, then match a C, and that's what you need to think, how you need to think about regexes. Match an A, then match a B, then match a C. If I put that into a state diagram, it would look something like this, right? We start, we first match an A, then we go to the next state. We then match a B, we go to the next state, and then we match a C, and we go to the match. If I were to code that in something that looks a bit like Python, it would look something like this. Yeah, we got the for loop there. Uh, we've got an index that walks over the whole string, and then we try if the position at index matches an A. If it does not, we raise an error. Index plus one match B. If not, raise. Index plus two match C. If not, raise. And if we did not raise, then we return true. If we get an exception, either because one of the raises here or because we are going beyond the end of the string, we continue. We're not going to stop short because the regex would never fit. No, we're going to try up until the last character. And only if we tried all that and we did not return it through anywhere, then we did not match, so we return a false. Right? In the diagram, it looks a little like this. Okay, we've got the regex, match an A, match a B, match a C, and we've got a string to search. That's one, two, A, B, A, B, C. So we start with the first character in the string. And we match that one to the A, right? The first step in our uh, diagram. Does not match, so we try the second character. Does the, match, the, does the two match the A? No, it doesn't. Okay, does the A match an A? Yes, it does, yay, move on. Does the B match a B? Yes, it does. Does the A match a C? No, it doesn't. Okay. Now what? We move back. And we move one character forward in the string. Remember the last one was the A. We move one forward. And we try again. Now, this might take a while, right? Anyway, we match all the three characters. And then we have a match. Fireworks. <coughs> Ta-da! <laughs> and that's it, really. Well, more or less. You see, there's, of course, some other stuff in this regex. Um, what if we have an OR statement? So we want to match either ABC or ABX. Now, if we look at this, then we might come up with a state diagram that looks something like this. Match an A, match a B, then match either a C or an X. But no, because regexes, the regex engine, is dumb. It's really dumb. It will create two paths. We try to match ABC. If that doesn't work, we try to match ABX. What does that look like? Well, if I match that against B, A, B, X, we first try the A in the upper path, doesn't match to the P, so we try again to match an A. And it still doesn't match. Weird. Uh. So we move on to the A, and we match that to the A in the upper path. Yes, it matches. Okay, the B matches. The C does not match. So the upper path does not match. Okay, we move on. Try the lower path. The A, the B, the C, the X. Sorry, not the C, the X. Yes, we've got a match. 
So what the execution model does is it tries every path. It tries the leftmost uh, path in your regex first, or uh, when you look at the graph, that's the upper path in the graph is tried first. And it returns success on the first full match. It fails when all paths fail. And it will try all paths before moving along. Now let's try that in a little more complicated regex. Still nothing fancy, but we're looking for and either antelope or ant. Um, and I'm using uh, RE compile here. Um, it has been said that compiling is not necessary because uh, the regex would compile for you anyway and it would, would use that compiled regex later on. It does not. Just try it with uh, time aid and you'll see that if you do not use compile but re.search for instance, every time you call your re.search, that regex is compiled again and again and again. Compiling it first and then using it later in your loops is going to save you a lot of time. Um, so what would this compiled regex match when I uh, try it against a string, an ant, an ant encountered an ant eater? It will match ant. Because it tries ant eater against ant, that doesn't match. It tries antelope against ant, doesn't match. And it tries, then tries ant against ant, and we have a match. Now, if I were to write that regex around and uh, place all the words uh, in alphabetical order, a bit easier to read maybe, and we try that again against a slightly different string, an ant eater encountered an ant, what would it match? The same bloody thing. It matches ant, and it does not look any further. It's done. There you go. So it looks for the first match. It does not look for the best match. Right. So, okay, if this regex is a programming language, then there must be a command language, right? There is. Every alphanumeric character is a command. And the command is, does the current character match me. If so, move on. If not, backtrack. And some punctuation is also a command. And I know you're looking, what, some punctuation? Yeah, this is where it gets a bit, a bit icky. Um, some punctuation. This, for instance, it's not a circle, it's a dot. And the dot matches a dot, so it does exactly what an alphanumeric character does, except that it also matches any other character. So actually, a dot matches any character, except for a new line, because that's something different. That's when we get to multi-line multi reg regexes. Don't think about that right now. Um, we also have a caret. And the caret matches, doesn't even match a, a uh, character, it matches the start of the string. The dollar does the same thing, but then for the end of the string. And we have some other tools. We, we've got OR, for instance. That's two square brackets, and then the characters uh, between the square brackets. Um, this matches either an O or an R. Um, we also have ranges, so we can match uh, all lowercase a through z. Um, that dash, the hyphen in, in there right now, doesn't do anything except uh, create a range. If it was in another position, like this, it would match a minus or an A or a Z. 
if the hyphen is in front of the square bracket, it matches a minus or, oh, sorry, a minus and an A or a Z. Um, we can concatenate those ranges. So if I want to look for a hexadecimal digit, this is what I do. We match either a decimal digit or capital A through to F or lowercase a through to F. Now you might be tempted to put some spaces in there just for visibility, right? Um, but then we'd match a 0 to, to a 9 or a space or a 0 to, to an F or a space or an A to an F. So that does something different. We also have nor, not or. The same square brackets, and now that carrot has a different meaning all of a sudden. It's between the square brackets, so now it means anything that is not an O or an R. And we have loops. Are you thinking loops? What loops? In regexes? Yes, loops. Just like the while in the for loop, except um, in regexes, the while in the for loop, the, the, the loops are actually both a while and a for loop at the same time. That sounds great, doesn't it? What does it do then? Well, it loops while there's no exception, but only for m to m uh, iterations. Now, m to n may mean 0 to infinity, but it's still only that much, right? And this is how we program a loop. This means match the previous character 0 or more times, 0 to infinity. If I have a regex A star, we will match an A zero or more times. So this will actually also match an empty string because there are zero A's in an empty string. We can um, look for a repetitive pattern actually like this. If we, we match either uh, we match an A and a B, put that between the round brackets, put a star beneath, behind it, and we're looking for A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, zero more times. Um, a or a B, zero more times, we use the square brackets, and dot star, we match anything, zero more times. Um, dot star is used a lot in regexes, but it's not your friend. It really isn't. And we'll show you why. But first I have to show you how this, um, this state diagram for this regex works. Right? So we remember that we try the upper path first. So we try to match against an A, and then we end up back in the same state. We try that until there's no more A's. Then we take the lower path and we move on to the next state in the regex. If we have the OR statement, we try either the A or the B, end up in the same state, or we try the OR, otherwise we move on to the next. If we have the A, B, C, we match an A, then we match a B, then we match a C, repeat, unless we encounter something else, and then we move on to the next state. The plus, another punctuation that uh, is a loop. It matches one or more time, and it looks exactly the same as the A star. Well, except that we do one extra stage in front of it. Try to match an A, then loop zero or more times. Question mark um, is a very short loop, matches zero or one. And we can specify specifically how many matches we want to have. And that's where we use the curly brackets and specify how many times you want to uh, find this, uh, how many times you want to match. 
um, so we match m times. We can also use m comma n, so we match m to n times. Now, let's loops. Except that in regex, we can unloop. And I don't think I've ever seen this in another language, but we can roll back the previous loop match. Uh, what? How does that work? Well, let's have this example here. Right? We've got a short sentence with some stray HTML codes in it. And I want to find that, that HTML code. So I create a regex with a loop. I look for a pointy bracket, and then I'll look for anything in between, and then I'll look for a closing pointy bracket. Right? We start to look for that, and we find the first pointy opening pointy bracket. Then next, we match any character zero or more times. Well, the B is any character, the pointy bracket is any character, the E, the X, the A, and so forth, they're all any character. And then we reach the end of the string. But we still have some regex left. We need the closing pointy bracket. It's not there. We're at the end of the string, there's nothing there. Right? So we fail. Except the regex engine goes back and says, hey, um, give me back that last character. So we get the dot back, and we match that against the pointy bracket. Still doesn't match. Okay, give me back the other character then. Okay, we get back the pointy bracket. We match. And yay! We've got a match. And we rolled back two characters. So in this example, that's not so bad, right? We only rolled back twice. But what if I have a longer text, and this is just a generated lower mipsum, don't try to read into it, but there's a few stray HTML over there. Now, if we had to roll back here, we had to roll back all the way from the last enim dot back to that pointy bracket. That's more than half the text it would have to unroll to get to the match. That would take a little long. So what do we do? We use minimal loops. And the minimal loop is exactly like the maximum loop, except that it has a question mark. It's more like zero or more. <laughs> so what does that do? Well, same thing, it finds the opening pointy bracket, and then it has to match anything, but because there's a star question mark here, it first checks if the next character isn't the next character in the regex. Well, this doesn't match, so it matches anything, we move on. Match again, hey, this does match. So we get a match, and we're finished. Now, this might even be a better match than we had back with the previous example, right? And it's way faster. So the minimal loop, execute the commands in the loop as few times as possible. So what would that look like in a diagram? I think you're gonna like this. We just do this. We try the upper path first. And then we do the loop. So what do we do? What do we use, minimal or maximal? Well, first of all, use the one regex that produces the expected result. We saw the difference in the results just now. Second, use the one that does the least backtracking. And on that backtracking, I've got the lorem ipsum text again, but this time, I've got two hashes in there. So, I'm just gonna uh, make this a little smaller. It doesn't contain any readable text anyway. So, let's just say we use the maximum loop to search for the text between those two hashes, including the hashes, right? If I run that, through time it on my laptop, 
it gives me a 633 nanosecond on average. Okay, what about the minimum loop then? If I run that, I get a whopping 1.79 microseconds. So it's three times slower. Why? Well, because most of the text is in between those two hashes. So in between those hashes, he's comparing each and every character to a hash. So it takes a bit longer. So you'd say, OK, that means that the maximum loop is the winner here, right? Well, hold on. There's another trick we can do. And we can forget about the dot star, but match anything that does not match a hash zero or more times. So how would that do? Oh, well, 429 uh, nanoseconds. We have a winner. It does not do backtracking. Because when it hits that second hash, it stops and it moves on in the regex. Matches the hash and it's finished. So, one takeaway at least, don't use this, use this. Right? So, a little bit about the RE module. I was going to talk about regexes and Python, right? So, the RE module, like I said, has the compile method. Um, you compile your uh, regex and then later in the function you use your regex to search for a string. Um, if I uh, use the search method, we will match anywhere in the string. Um, we could also use the caret, we've seen, that would match only the beginning. So if I search the string here, we'll match from the start of the string. Now the regex has a helper function for that. You can use regex match, which actually does the same thing, so you don't need to use the caret. If I want to match against the whole string, the complete string, I will use the caret to indicate this regex must start at the beginning of the string, and we use the dollar to indicate that it must end at the end of the string. So it will only match if the whole string matches the regex. Again, there's a other um, helper method for that, which is the full match. And so the full match, well, secretly I think it just adds the carrot and the dollar, but that's what it does. Um, the split, I'm moving on too, too fast here, sorry. Um, the split is just like a string dot split, except it allows you to split on a regex, which could be handy. Um, find all will find all matches and return them as a list. And find iter does the same, but returns an iterator. So you can loop over your matches. Um, Sub, my rec dot sub is the same as the string that sub replace a regex, a matched regex with another string. Um, so we, we talked about that uh, Unicode, the SRE supports Unicode. Now if we have the, uh, the range 0 to 9, that does, well I'm not sure how many digits there are that are not just like the 0 to 9, but 
the backslash D is a shortcut, it will match any digit, even if it's a Unicode one that I don't know about. Um, backslash capital E, this is within the regex, right? Backslash capital E does not match a digit. Backslash lowercase s matches any white space character. And that's not just the space, that's also the tap, the new line, uh, the, the uh, page feed, the vertical tap even. So, backslash capital S matches any non-white space character. And then we have the W, backslash W, matches a word, capital W matches not a word. And finally to a lowercase b matches a word boundary, which means regex found a word, and either at the start or the end of that word, we have a lowercase, lowercase b. Uppercase is not a boundary. Um, I had thought of uh, doing an example of this, but I forgot about it, sorry. <laughs> okay, other things. The um, flags, the, reg the regex module also supports flags. And um, th this is just a few of them, it's not complete. But we've got the flag re.ascii, and you can inline that into a regex with a uh, question mark A between the round brackets. And that will ignore all the um, Unicode uh, compatibility. It will just do ASCII. Um, ignore case is handy. You've seen that I use the uppercase A through F and lowercase a through f, ignore case, and I can leave one of those ranges out. Um, we've got multi-line, and that's a special thing. Um, if you want to do multi-line uh, regex, then look that up, because it might not work exactly as you thought. Um, the carrot and the dollar actually work per line in a multi-line regex and not for the beginning of a whole paragraph and the end of a whole paragraph, for instance. Um, the re.x or re for both um, is a way to uh, enable you to add comments into your regex. So you can build a multi-line regex and um, add comments so that your colleague that comes about it in three months from now still understands what you're trying to do in this thing. So there's multiple ways where you can uh, set these, these flags. Um, you can add them in the beginning of your regex, opening bracket and a question mark, and then the different options, closing bracket. And another way is to add them as flags in your function call. And here you need to do the, um, that thing there, the pipeline to combine the different options you want to use. And that's it, really. Um, it took me a bit longer when I practiced this. But that's it. Any questions?
Thank you, Danny. So we have like four microphones in the alleys uh, for the questions, and we have we have some time to to, to give our questions. I have one. Hi. Just out of curiosity, um, do Regesp um, support uh, Chinese characters? You said Unicode, but what are each? Is that a word? Is that a um, yes, the, the, um, uh, in the SRE module, there's uh, Uni Unicode support, so yeah, I don't really know how that works with Chinese characters, but yeah, it should support that some way. I've never tried, but it should. Hi. Uh, Hi. You mentioned compile. Can you give us uh, what, in, uh, some indication of what happens under the hood when we compile the regex? That this produces the code you saw out before or something different? Um, the, the compile will make sort of like the, the, the byte array that is executed by your uh, regex engine. So it's, it's um, I, I, no, I don't know how I could show that, but it's actually what is physically executed within the engine that is pre produced by the compile. Yeah? Hello. Um, I have a question about parentheses. Uh, because you showed an example of looking for A and a plus B string in parentheses and then asterisk. How does it relate to groups in regular expressions? Because as far as I know, you use parentheses for groups as well. Yeah, that is actually a group you are looking for. Um, I've not come to, I wanted to include groups, but I was afraid that I was going to go beyond my time limit. So, but that is actually an a unnamed group. Okay, thank you. We also have look ahead and look behind assertions. Uh, is it easy to give us an example of uh, what happens, uh, like the diagram you saw right before, for more simple things? Ooh. Um. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, no, I wouldn't know how to just create it just now. Sorry. Anyone else? I do have one. Um, it's more basically, well, based on your experience with, with regexes and your examples with minimal loops, maximal loops, and, um, and refined character ranges. Uh, so yeah, when we have, or when we know the, the input, then we can compare the performance and decide which one to use. What would, do you have recommendations or how would you, how would you go before you actually have input, right? At design time, which, which loop would you, would you choose? Um, well, between the minimum and the maximum, it's actually pretty easy because if you look at that, if, you get be, if your match is gonna be beyond half of your string, then it's better to use the maximum because that will have the least backtracking. If it's shorter, then it's better to use the minimum. But yeah, that's... Of course, you, you, you need to know what your input is going to look like before you can make that, that decision. Okay. No. Good. No civil bullet. Okay. Thank you. Is there any more questions? No, I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> uh, maximum and minimum loop is what is the documentation is stated as greedy and non-greedy regular expressions. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Yeah. All right, thank you again, and let's, let's just give a round of applause for Danny.